Hello, my name is Adam Bean and welcome to the 17th edition of uh, AirHex TV and uh, Happy New 2020. And it's the very first AirHex TV in the next uh, decade. So, um, starting with the topics. And by the way, uh, from, from now, I will uh, stream the content via Vimeo. And uh, the URI is going to be this one. It could actually change, but I would try to keep it constant. So Vimeo event. So it's going to be a streaming event. And I will always start at 8 p.m. CET or summertime CET. And so it's two hours later than usually. So, okay, let's start with the topics. And uh, the very first one, I published two hours ago a new podcast episode with uh, Robert Brem. Prem uh, about uh, maintainability and dependencies and maintaining uh, Jakarta Eno dependencies projects and web components projects. So you might like that. And um, it's the first one. The next one, uh, we are right after uh, the air hacks, the uh, winter air hacks. And uh, it was a really nice crowd this time. So we cover lots of topics. And uh, what I also did, uh, because I got some ideas during the workshops, I um, set up a new uh, spring uh, workshops, uh, so early 2020 workshops. And the first one is going to be MicroProfile with Quarkus, but we won't stop with, uh, with uh, MicroProfile, but also sh show some uh, proprietary or custom Quarkus features. The first day was the idea you know, to build the backend, and the next day is going to be a build a front end for that. There are actually two independent workshops, but um, uh, you can you can uh, pick two days. And then the, the next time, uh, the next day, micro front ends, we will cover uh, how to build with web components or more serious applications. So uh, what I did right now um, uh, at the airport Munich in November. So we built a web components app and um, I think we can go even farther. So what I will focus on state management, Redux, and custom elements, custom components, and, uh, and a little bit more sophisticated web standards workshop. So um, this is uh, both also, and uh, January the 14th, there is going to be a free Jakarta EE official streaming event, and uh, I will discuss whether Jakarta EE servers are dead or not, with some surprising outcomes, I would say. So I will discuss this topic with, of course, a little bit of code, a little bit of Docker Kubernetes, and uh, just to discuss this topic, because I get these questions a lot, and I think it is even an interesting topic. So um, this happens in, uh, actually, in almost one week, so it's not far away. So uh, you will have to sign it, sign in, but it's completely free. So it's actually the same infrastructure as the Jakarta EE conference we did, the um, Jakarta One conference. Okay, and now, um, First, uh, I would like to discuss the last uh, questions first. Why? Because um, what I did the very first time, which was a really bad idea, if you go to my blog, you can actually watch me live right now. So not to be distracted, I just removed the element. So I cannot refresh the browser because I will see myself, which is distracting. So what I would like to do is I would like to uh, discuss the last uh, questions first and then and then close the tab. So. The first was, is it possible to have different JSON, JSONB config for different JAXRS resources? Question from my blog. So if we, uh, if we open uh, the tab and, 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 and take a look on that. on that, um, It is um, questions from, I think it is already open. It is uh, one of these. There should be somewhere about, um, but um, it is of course. So, and of course, uh, there is a way to do this. And um, I would like, I actually implemented that and I will write a blog post uh, probably uh, this week. And uh, the code is already there. So I only have, you know, to copy and paste the code in, into, a, into a post. And um, so the question, is it possible or not? So uh, what, what, uh, what uh, the developer asks here to have different JSON B, JSON binding configurations per resource. And uh, what I did, I created a proof of concept with um, uh, here, and um, this is a uh, project with two JAXRS resources. So we have um, the first ping, and we have the second ping. So there are two pings, ping and ping, which is actually not possible. Both pings with the same URI, but uh, and uh, the first one outputs the first one and the second one, the second and second. And there's one entity with public fields and this is uh, the JSON B entity. 
and the constructor is just for convenience. So what I did is there is one uh, application, registered application called First API, and uh, it just exposes the first ping, and the second uh, JAXRS API exposes the second ping, and in addition to that, it also exposes a custom um, a custom JSONB configuration. Well, what it does, it registers context resolver dynamically, not with the provider annotations, rather than uh, dynamically or programmatically. So now, if I go to the um, to my browser and uh, try that, so we are here. Take a look at the raw data. So if I do this, um, raw data, you see this is. Uh, this is uppercase, the properties are written uh, uppercase in the second API. So if I replace the second API with first API, with first API, then you will see there is a lowercase. So we have two independent JSONB configuration depending on the entry URI. So this is what you can do easily. What you can, of course, also do, you can have, uh, you can just have configuration so what I could do, I could just use the JSON uh, JSON builder in inside every method in uh, in in JAXRS resource. And what I also could do, I could uh, write a message body reader. No, sorry, message body writer or in message message body reader with custom JSON B configurations. So um, probably I will also write a uh, message body reader and writer because it's very easy to show you how it would work with uh, with Jack's So there's one question of from from my blog because uh, you were lazy on the on the, <laughs> on the GitHub gist. So it's okay to do um, so then I can cover my question my more comments from my blog. So this was that one, and uh, the next one. So I got a comment from uh, Manuel. So I would just open this in uh, in a new tab. And this is here, additional. So I got the manual. I know this uh, guy from a project, so a really nice guy. And uh, this is also an interesting project with uh, uh, vanilla, uh, Jakarta, Java with micro profile or only a view dependencies. So very pragmatic and very interesting story. But um, what, what, what he found out, there's actually interesting stuff. There is a standard for uh, HTTP header warnings. So um, there's a header for warning. And you can use the uh, the the uh, the this header to carry warning, so it could be actually perfect, uh, you know, to uh, to write uh, for instance like validation or business errors in, in or additional information in this uh, warning uh, warning header. And it say this warn text should be in natural language, so it's actually it would describe, for instance, you know, some uh, not like uh, internal server error rather than more business business uh, business errors. So this was interesting, and uh, the last one is the difference between IDE and what deployment. So um, I get this question a lot, and uh, what sh what sh is like primitive tool, and what it does is it watches your folder, and actually it should run behind the scenes right now because I deployed that exactly with what. So um, this is the what it watches um, this uh, JAXRS multiple URIs right now. And it deployed that uh, a few hours ago uh, to all servers I have on my machine. And now I'm using Payara to test it out. So if we go here to here and I say localhost, localhost 8080, I should see uh, Payara exactly. Now, um, and the question is, what's the difference between a WOD deployment and IDE deployment? And uh, so the WOD deployment, what it uses is the most uh, primitive deployment you can probably get. It just copies a war to a folder in hopes that the server will pick it up and deploy it. So it's very primitive. And the IDE is a little bit smarter. What well, They have more tight integration with the uh, application servers. So what uh, some they are doing, for instance, they would use you know, the JBoss, uh, for instance, um, JBoss CLI. So like the programmatic REST interface or uh, or Payara, uh, JAXRS, uh, or JAXRS REST API. So uh, the IDEs are usually more sophisticated. So what's the difference? So if I just uh, if what publishes the uh, war, uh, it, what does not know doesn't know when the, the the war becomes available, because it also doesn't matter. But from IDE, you actually can know wh whether the uh, war becomes uh, available or not, because the deployment protocol. So if you if you deploy something via the wire. Um, uh, you get feedback from application server. Yes, the deployment was successful, or it wasn't successful. So this is this is the main difference. 
So I hope we covered all the questions from my blog. So the last three questions are covered. So uh, we can actually close that. Additional head, um, uh, he uh, headers are covered. But by the way, in this blog post, if you're interested, because it's open right now, I showed how to uh, access private fields from JSONB um, objects. And by the way, I'm I'm actually don't like uh, the idea anymore. So all my JSONB B objects right now have public fields. So I don't need you know the getters and setters. So it's just a waste of of characters. Okay. So we also uh, covered the uh, the Jakarta E um, article and uh, or or, or uh, event. And um, now let's focus on the real questions from you. So the first one is. Is a C, uh, CSRF and XSS and uh, and other similar attacks and other similar attacks are still possible in JavaScript client REST backends? How we can protect against them, especially in microservice architectures? So, um, so what what they both are doing is so um, so what C, uh, CSRF is doing is it would be like the application belongs to you, but what Hacker uh, was able to do is to inject some JavaScript, which will call your API. So this is actually uh, this uh, XCSRF, uh, and cross-site scripting is uh, similar. So actually, is uh, is the is the um, how to call it? No task is the event where somewhere is able someone is able to to uh, manipulate your website from another domain or website. This is cross-site scripting. And uh, CSRF means uh, someone tries to call your legitimate API and perform actions uh, you don't like to perform. So, and what is actually the remedy or what is the protection of that is usually you would create a secret or a header and you, only you know the header, no one else. And then if the hacker will try, you know, to send a an, an request to your API, it would know about the header. And then it can, and then your server will reject reject the 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 um, request. The question is, is something like this possible in JavaScript client with REST uh, backend? Um, if you c completely control the application, of course, it is not possible. I mean, because uh, no one is able to access your uh, front end uh, in JavaScript. It's the same like. Imagine you have a Swing application. So is it possible that someone injects Java code to your Swing application? Uh, of course not. But if someone, if you have Google Ads or AdWords or whatever, or just uh, or just uh, random ads, then something, uh, then you are running actually an, an an external code which does not belong to you, and then more more stuff can happen. It's exactly like exactly in Swing. If you would embed it, you know, you will load uh, dynamically classes over the wire or in JavaFX, and uh, and then you can use reflection, you know, to do uh, something malicious. So, um, so usually, or usually, in uh, in if this is controlled environment, um, it actually cannot happen. So, um, no, actually, because um, I'm not 100% sure. I mean, I mean, uh, there are really crazy hacks, but uh, how no how to get into your app from outside is impossible. Should be impossible. Uh, how can we protect them, especially in microservice architecture? So, with custom headers or custom cookies. Um, yeah, this is a, a, a simple protection. Where should we store the JWT token on JavaScript client as a good security practice? So um, unsolved problem. So there are lots of discussion around that, and I personally like to store it in um, in uh, session storage. Um, some people be prefer uh, um, H um, the cookies. Nothing is perfect. So um, the cookies have downsides, uh, down uh, and the and the session storage as well. Um, so. And uh, and this is the f um, forgot to mention this is the uh, ah this is the uh, iron. So what's my opinion about uh, R2DBC? And this is like the um, a uh, a reactive uh, JDBC driver. And um, so I like it a lot. Why? Because without this, uh, reactive programming does not make a lot of sense because uh, the database will block. And what this does is um, I didn't look at the source code, but I just read you know the description. And um, what um, and uh, what uh, the uh, the and actually we implemented the last air hacks. We used the Postgres reactive client from Quarkus. So what you did the air hacks, just to, to to see how it works. But what's the benefit? Um, and I actually wondered myself why the database are not doing that. So and um, I have to look it up. But I think I gave a talk 
at a conference, and this was like a Borland conference back then, uh, and they had uh, an own database. I forgot the name. Uh, it was uh, the database from Borland. And uh, I, I, I had a chat with engineers because it only supported JDBC and always ask myself why the database does not use JDBC as a as, as two-way channel. So why not no database does not send events that something change in the database. And back then I had some trouble with caching. So I always ask myself why the database is not able, you know, to notify you that it is actually changed. So, I mean, this is uh, very simple. And uh, I think it was uh, around 2000. Um, it has to be around 2000, so this was the, the talk I, I, I gave to the um, database people there. And um, and this is similar, So except you would you have find and forget to a database and you will subscribe and you will receive the, the, the results from a different channel. And so what, what you will have, you will have a non-blocking I.O. from the beginning to the end. And right now the JDBC is blocking, so every when you, when you when you're not blocking you know uh, before the database you are forced to block because all jdbc drivers are blocking actually the most of the jdbc drivers are blocking so um i appreciate that um but i have to sell you know in most project it won't make any difference in my world but it i mean this is the right move in the right direction so if everything is you no know, reactive they should be also reactive but it's not like you know all projects are going to to be now uh you know <laughs> consume less whatever 50% less memory or whatever no it's just nice api it is nice api in case everything is reactive so um okay so uh, happy new year to uh, ion so now the uh, cosmisk and uh cosmisk so his uh, f first name is cosmisk and the last name decay i guess so um how would you go, go about managing transactions in a WebSocket AE application? And uh, what I understand here, uh, you would like to have a, a series of uh, of uh, of WebSocket events, and the 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 web the WebSocket events have to be grouped into a, a a transaction. So what you will need, you will need a session. So WebSockets have already session, and uh, the transactional entity manager won't work. So what you can do, you can use the uh, the the open transaction manager. So the transactional, the the uh, the usual transaction manager. Um, so in in Java, all the all the methods uh, are. If you have a transaction in a boundary, for instance, the uh, the the uh, the transaction is going to be to be closed after the method. And uh, what you would like to to have here to keep your transactions open. So you would like you know to to open the transaction the first time and then close the transaction after five message arrived. So what we did back then is, um, and this is not the, um, actually, if you inject the entity, entity manager with persistence context, wait a second, persistence context, entity manager, javadoc, I have completely forgot the, um, the name of that. And uh, uh, yes, I accept everything for now, but uh, this is the, um, Persistence context annotation javadoc. This is what I would like to have. Persistence context. Exactly. And this is synchronization type. So we have the syn synchronized and unsynchronized. This is uh, not what I meant. And then we have uh, persistence context type. And this is the extended. And this is what I uh, so what I what I used a lot a few years ago so transaction is default it means the applica the uh, the um, the entity manager is going to be uh, to be closed or flushed and cleared after every transaction and this extended means it 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 will uh, all the entities are going to be attached remain attached so you could you can just experiment with that so uh, the basic idea would be you would store a reference to the entity manager in the websocket session and then you know decide when the uh, transaction uh, opens and when it closes. And because the entity manager is not transactional anymore, you will have you know to invoke commit by yourself on the entity manager. Um, or with the extended, what we did there was a trick. We had uh, all the methods were not transactional, but these uh, the last method I usually call that saved. Save. Wait a second. And I'm being extended entity manager manager should be an old blog post
And where is the... Ten years ago. This is the extended entity manager. And there's one method called save. And this comes with requires new. So what you could do here is you could just uh, you know invoke whatever you like, and with this one method you will see you know everything at once in a database. So I would try to I, we did it with JSF back then and uh, and state. So we bound the entity manager to the session, and then the user could work you know with the entities you know add remove and work with the objects, and in the end say safe and everything was in the database. So this was the trick, and I think you can do the same with WebSockets. Okay. Now, let's see. The next one, uh, I got actually an, 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 an email from the Northern Europe and with the questions about my opinion about JPMS and Java 9 modules and microservice versus microservices. And I usually ignore all technical questions via emails because we have air hacks, but uh, I got this, uh, I heard this question during the eggs as well, and I sort of thought, okay, this could be interesting. And uh, the following. Um, Java 9 modules make absolute sense if you're building, you know, uh, Lambda functions or servers. So you, uh, you have a platform which runs longer, and you need some kind of modularization because your platform is big. So usually platforms are bigger than business services. And uh, microservices are more suitable for business apps or for something... Yeah, business-like, or how to call it business-like, you know, or uh, consumer-facing or user-centric. This is for my more and more or less bus business-centric, because um, so you have a small chunks of functionality, and this this uh, there just does make any sense, you know, to have one microservice and inside the microservice is Java 9 modules. So I don't know the the, the case. So um, I have to admit, since I don't know the last times I did uh, these Java 9 modules was at the AHEX. Uh, someone asked me about that, so I show how it works. But in my uh, commercial projects, I we don't I don't do JPMS modules a lot because I spend all my time right now in the uh, backends, and on the backends, the J JPMS modules are not that exciting, and uh, for me at least. And uh, I actually thought about if if I would implement, let's say, plugins for what the so JPMS uh, modules could make sense. Okay. Tan Jidur says, uh, "Happy New Year!" Also, happy to, uh, Happy New Year to you. And he asked me, "How are you running OpenShift in production environments? Uh, are you paying for commercial support?" So I'm not paying. My clients are paying for commercial support. So um, uh, I have uh, one client just runs. Uh, so w once startup runs OpenShift and uh, they, they just install OpenShift by themselves. Um, two, two clients or more, I would say, five plus clients are just bought Red uh, support from Red Hat and uh, they installed OpenShift on their service. And one startup uh, just uses the online version of OpenShift with the free tier and pays a little bit for, for uh, demo apps. And which way do you think is the much more effective for an enterprise startup looking to use OpenShift in production? So, and the, and the second part is more interesting because if you are a startup, I, I mean, uh, let's see, who are you? So, software developer. So, um, so you actually, and and you are focusing as, as it looks like. So, uh, you are listening to Airhex TV, and so you are interested in the matter. If you are building a startup, I would say. It is, you know, there's common perception like, you know, startups should focus, you know, just on the business and then, um, and, and yeah, this, this may work, but in, on, in longer term, you will have, you know, to know what happens on your platform, I would say, to be uh, successful or, uh, you know, to, uh, to, to be able to fix your problems by yourself. I think this is very important. So, and um, what you could actually do is, you can actually install OpenShift, uh, the, the open source version of OpenShift first, run it, then you understand what it actually is, you know, when it breaks and so forth. And uh, and then if you understand, you know, the complete stack, then you can actually buy a commercial version of OpenShift. And then let's, you know, uh, could be even managed by uh, by Red Hat. Um, so actually, this is, would be uh, my approach, you know, why not to run OpenShift, or even if you are a small company and you're already expert, just run, you know, 
blank Kubernetes without, uh, and then you, you, you won't get, you know, the um, you won't get the uh, Docker registry, you won't get the load balancer, so you will, you will have to create a lot of stuff by yourself, but you will understand what's going on there. But if you have no time, so just, you know, buy something in the cloud. So it's really hard to, to tell. Monsieur Shy Guy from Nigeria. So this is um, uh, uh, Airhex alumni. And uh, cool story. A Shy Guy came from Nigeria and I asked him, you know, what about your flight time? And he spent 16 hours in the airplane. And there was another guy who came from, uh, from Sweden and he did an experiment and he wanted to come by train. And he spent 24 hours in a train, not from Sweden, from Finland, uh, to come from Finland. And um, so this is actually uh, interesting, right? Uh, that uh, you can um, you can can be faster to uh, coming to to air hacks uh, in 16 hours through from Nigeria than I know from Finland, which is which is crazy. And uh, so thank you for attending air hacks, and it was really fun to see you again. And now the first question is: Please, do you have any screencasts running on web application GUI? Uh, either HTML5 JavaScript or say prime faces on Quarkus. So um, actually HTML5 and JavaScript I use a lot with Quarkus. I could do something with it, but it's trivial. So if you like, I can show you something. Uh, I use, for instance, the setup. Uh, I use um, um, browser sync with Quarkus. So as Quarkus, I misuse Quarkus as HTTP server and as a backend. And if you if you say prime faces, I never I didn't try that, but it should actually work because Quarkus supports servlets, and uh, prime faces are based on servlets, so it could or should work. I never tried that, but um, I I could actually try it. So I'm curious whether whether it will work or not. So is there any Porcupine like implementation of Quarkus for dealing with thread pooling and all what has profile micro profile fault torrents API done differently? And we actually covered that that and at the at the AXTV, uh, AXTV, AXCOM, so and you attended. So yes, um, this is the uh, fault torrents from Eclipse. Um, so what do you uh, what you can have? So the uh, the Porcupine is a bulkhead pattern implementation. And uh, there is a notation called Balkats, and uh, with asynchronous, you get very similar behavior to Porcupine. And this is one of the reasons why uh, I didn't release new versions from Porcupine, because we have now Eclipse microprofile uh, for torrents, and uh, you can kill this dependency or remove the dependency. Uh, one less dependency is always good, even if the dependency was created by me. I mean, it's also a you know, bus factor and so forth. <laughs> okay, now. So please, what is the most efficient way of dealing with the uploads, writing to a database or file path? So with uploads, actually, with uploads, the you know reactive R2DBC could be interesting for uploads because um, you are writing you know to uh, to to a database and you don't have to to wait. It's just you're writing asynchronously to uh, straight to a database, and um, and. Um, that's all. And if you would like, you have a large files, and I know you know Shay guy is working, you know, in in in, in larger ra larger setups. So if you need to know a, a lots of uploads, then I would just use you know, for instance, servlets, or if you have Quarkus, uh, use something proprietary proprietary with Vertex. But before you use something proprietary, I would test servlets first. Usually they are fast enough. So with servlets, you will receive a stream, and then with the stream, you can redirect the stream and write to a database. But um, having said that, usually the database do not handle, you know, binary files very well. So be careful with that. So now, because you asked me that, uh, so I added, uh, added uh, a, a new question uh, by myself. And uh, because server-side rendering like JSF and Struts and um, REST API with Java. And uh, I wanted actually to, to, to write something like, you know, why server-side rendering became less popular, and uh, the the answer the answer is because um, one thing is with uh, server-side rendering, uh, you are just you don't get any API. So your API is your uh, your GUI. So uh, your application exposes uh, user interfaces directly, and uh, so if you someone would like to call you directly, it it it. Either will have to have screen scraping, which is crazy, like it will parse, you know, the uh, the, the the HTML page, or you will have to um, 
um, um, expose another uh, REST API on top of the already existing GUI. So uh, what usually happens is uh, most applications are designed that way in Java that you have just a REST API and this, the same REST API is used for GUI applications like JavaScript, HTML5, and back then we used JavaFix or Swing, and uh, and other microservices. So you de develop the API first and only once, and multiple applications can access the, your business logic through different channels. So this is the main idea why server-side rendering became less popular. Um, but nothing will prevent you, you know, to have server-side rendering for to pre-populate pre HTML in, in a front-end microservice, which calls via the REST API a back-end microservice. This, this could make sense with, for instance, JSPs. Now, two hours ago, uh, this is Monsieur Gabriel Ha Dia, Diaconu, I get. Bad, bad people value more. <laughs> so, um, he asked me, in this microservice world, do you see a good approach to mix services powered by multiple vendors, frameworks, Micronaut, Spring, Quarkus? Um, I mean, so for instance, uh, Micronaut is very very interesting uh, framework, but they have their own APIs and uh, and interfaces, and and someone will have to learn that. So if someone is willing to learn that, of course you could use Micronaut, um, and Spring is popular. So there is a less an issue because lots of people know Spring already, and Quarkus is micro profile. And um, in my world, we come from come from Java E and Jakarta E, and uh, micro profile is a subset of that. So uh, Quarkus is the natural natural choice. And not only Quarkus, we have, uh, for instance, Hadidon, and uh, and um, and other micro profile frameworks, and. Um, uh, Cumulus E, for instance, forgot, forgot about that because uh, there were attendees who were actually committers on Cumulus uh, uh, E at the last AHEX workshops. And um, do you see a good approach to mixed services part? I mean, if the uh, microservice is implemented right, you shouldn't even know that Java is inside the, the, the microservice. You just call the API and you are, and you are done. And by the way, uh, what's also interesting, Quarkus provides a Spring compatibility layer, Spring Boot compatibility layer, without even uh, having a reference to Spring Boot. It's like uh, they only support the API. So you can run uh, Spring Boot applications on Quarkus, which is, uh, and then, of course, use uh, all the microprofile goodness as well. Um, yeah. And about GraalVM, do you think this year would be a year that GraalVM will be an important part in our apps? Or in my projects it already is and i mean this is an extremely interesting option because what i do in my projects i have uh, i start a micro profile project then then translate it to gralvm show that I, you can actually save 90 percent of memory and then all these crazy discussions just stop and then we just go forward with whatever we we did before and uh, i don't have you know this is what's Exactly the same decision I would say 10 years ago. I have to justify myself why I not write any DAOs. So what I usually did, I wrote DAOs up front. Then uh, after two weeks, uh, the discussion settled. I deleted the DAO and never got the question again. And the same is with you know, memory consumption of Java E servers or Jakarta E servers. So what we do, we uh, just show that you can cross-translate Quarkus to GraalVM, and then save 90% of all, of all uh, memory, then uh, the discussion will stop, and then we just uh, develop uh, the um, application and then just think about the option of having uh, Graal, GraalVM. So, uh, yes, uh, it, 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 it is going to be uh, become interesting, and uh, what I, for instance, did, um, I created a few business apps for myself, and they replace, you know, commercial apps. And uh, I use GraalVM, so this is a binary image, which uh, runs on my Mac, and I can just, you know, uh, launch it from from the dock. And this is actually a Quarkus app with HTTP port. So this is uh, not not that easy without Graal. So uh, with Graal, you get the option to have, you know, one simple uh, image. And by the way, there's also if you would like to save m money with serverless, uh, sometimes there are use cases you can also use, you know. GraalVM based technology. And um, I have to write the prediction for 2020. Um, 
uh, this week or next week. But um, I think GraalVM is, is, is a big thing and really amazing what Oracle achieved there. Perfect. So um, we are done, I would say. Uh, so there are hopefully no more questions here. So uh, Twitter is quiet, which is very good. And the chat is not only quiet, it's absolutely that. So I would say, and by the way, uh, there's also a chat in the uh, AHEX TV uh, channel, so you can chat. I, I just w will skip properly the chat, but if it's uh, used a lot, I will use it the next time. So I would say thank you a lot and uh, see you next month at 8 p.m. CET and uh, with the new uh, new URI, which uh, uh, I will publish frequently, which points to Vimeo, no more Ustream. So thank you. See you at the March workshops, if you like. So where are the workshops? Workshops, nmbean.com. Exactly. We will talk about Quarkus, of course, with Graal. And then we will just focus one day of build rich applications without any dependencies. So thank you a lot and bye.